Hello, welcome to the Bush League Gaming Podcast, your source for ordinary opinions from ordinary gamers. Today we are discussing the book Ask Iwata. I'm your host, Jacob Bush, and with me today, he thinks the first rule of Fight Club is no pulling hair. Leader of Nintendites, Ryan Scalf. I feel like you, no one should be pulling hair if you're in a fight club, right? I guess. I don't know. I also tell everyone that I'm in a fight club. Do you? Yeah. We He's used not. to do that in high school. Did you? Yeah, we'd like a bunch of kids would meet up. Did you do this? Uh, a bunch of kids would meet up in like the school. Oh, we did this. I don't want to talk about bathroom. This. And the then bathroom. like we did what body boxing? Yeah. Did you ever do that? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. We did this out on no the face. on the baseball field. No face. No. Out where teachers couldn't see us. Yeah, it was super stupid. First rule fight club. That voice you just heard is legitimately comp- contemplating getting his nose pierced. Your favorite Crip boy, Nick Beard. I am, as of tomorrow. Well, let's see, uh, when you guys hear this, by the time this comes out, I will no longer be at a Fortune 100 company, and if I want to pierce my nose, I'm just thinking about doing it. I mean, why not? <laughs> so, Nick has really, at, I think he's just had to hide his true self for so long. Yeah. Yeah. And he's it's like, all just coming out. Rebelling. I'm just, yeah. I'm walking right out. For the listener at home, he literally has a fake nose ring in right now. Oh, well, you don't need to talk about that. It's in right now. <laughs> Try pulling it out, Brian. Is it real? Oh, my gosh. Oh, Could you imagine right if you pull it? He's just like just pulling like his nose out. Anyways, we we're here to talk about Ask Iwata. Ask Iwata was released on April 13th, 2021. Hardcover purchase is about $20 on Barnes & Noble. What did you guys purchase digitally, right? Yeah iTunes. It was How like much? fifteen bucks. Fifteen bucks. Right? I have no idea. Price was not even an option. It didn't matter. It didn't book. matter. Yeah. yeah. It, didn't it was matter. Nintendo, so I was going to consume it. Yeah. So let's start it off. I mean, so we're going to go basically chapter by chapter, talking about quotes that stood out to us. I, we all have kind of a running list of notes, but first off, I want to talk about like what do you think overall of the book? I really enjoyed it. I don't know about you. I, I mean, there was so many little quotes that I felt like were gold i mean yeah. there were so many things he said it, the stories it's not even like it's not like he was revolutionizing anything it was just like such wisdom yeah. over and over and over just like simple little truths that i feel like everyone should hear whether you work in a corporate setting or you're a programmer or in any other industry yeah i thoroughly enjoyed the book i didn't know what to expect to be honest i didn't know if this was just going to be a full-blown leadership book or inside nintendo and it feels like you get a little bit of both of those yeah but it's more <clears throat> kind of one of my main takeaways was it felt like i was peering into nintendo and kind of understanding a little bit how the mechanisms have turned the company just based on his type of personality and, and leadership and stuff like that so i was less uh I felt like I understood Nintendo a little bit better. Uh, yeah, I walked away yeah. with a higher appreciation of yeah. Nintendo. Yeah. And some of the like, things that we criticize a lot, I kind of saw their side a little bit. I'm yeah. not going to... Not we'll, fully. We'll get to it. but I'm not going to fully give them the, uh, the pass on it. But I do see a little bit more of their business side. Yep. Sure. Some yeah. of the conversations they have about it. Yeah, it doesn't make it right, but sure. And I'm still going to consume it. Yeah, we're still going to buy it. So let's start off with the preface. So you guys don't have any notes on the preface, but basically I think it's worth noting this book isn't written by Iwata. He passed away in 2015, I believe. Is that yep. right? 2015. It's a lot of it's like reflections from, uh, he originally published some writings on the website. And for the listener, there's a lot of Japanese names, some Japanese titles and words. I might butcher them. Butcher, we yeah, might butcher them. Absolutely. Apologies up front. But the website, Hobo, Nikon, Itoi, Shinbun, it's butchered. You nailed that. Thank you. Um, he had some writings on that website published there. So some of the excerpts are from that. Some of them are from the series Awada Asks, which is a column that Nintendo used to publish on the website. So it's kind of an amalgamation of a lot of different sources kind of coming together. And then at the end, there's some sources of his close friends and colleagues that come in and say some things about him too. So right. starting off... The first thing that you, you open this book, it says, on my business card, I'm a corporate president. In my mind, I'm a game developer, but in my heart, I'm a gamer. And that's a quote from Iwata himself. Yeah. And I thought that's a great way to start off the, the book. It's kind and of- I got the sense that's totally true. Yes. Like he is 100% a gamer. The way that he talked about games, it was, uh, I mean, it, it almost felt like he was having conversations with his friends in this book, like we have about what could be better about games, yeah. um, what we didn't like and did like. It, it was really interesting hearing from his perspective because he's not just putting out games that he doesn't care about. You know, he was, he's 
very intentional about designing his games for other people like him. Yes. Yeah, it was, it's, uh, that's one of the biggest takeaways. And that's what I, I don't know who, I don't really know anything about the current president of Nintendo, but I know at least at this time, the leadership was like perfect. I I feel like, cause he brings, and we'll go into some of the details, but he brings a, a technical background of a software developer. Right. But then he has these leadership skills that are phenomenal. Yeah. yeah, which is also uh, just to note, because I didn't really pick up on this till the end of the book, uh, he was younger than all of his other colleagues. I just didn't realize that. So just a very gifted, yeah. uh, young kind of leader from just, it's just an innate talent that he had. I have the the numbers of his age during those presidencies and I'll, I'll detail this, but he was young for yeah. both of them. So let's start off with a quote that Nick highlighted. This is about... Iwata's interviewing process, and he basically setting you up a little bit here. He interviewed the entire company, his first, uh, his first presidency at a company. So it was HAL Laboratories. When he became president, he decided to interview the entire company and just find out details. So Nick, if you want to read some of those quotes that you highlighted. Yeah, definitely. One of the first ones I highlighted was, uh, he says, this is why I spent my first month as president interviewing everybody at the company. The discoveries were endless. My plan was to be a sounding board and to get a sense of what was happening. But when I sat down with each person individually, I was blown away by how much I was learning. The idea was to figure out everybody's strengths and weaknesses. Without this kind of knowledge, I knew I couldn't make a decisions on behalf of the entire company. Um, and I just think that's really important. It, it stuck out to me because I interview people for a living. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm in HR, and so some of this is just kind of right up my alley. But um, it, I think it just kind of goes to show that, like, you know, you can come in as a president and do all of these things. But like he sat down first and just started interviewing people. Like that's truly how you get to the core of like understanding a company. It's also the most time consuming and energy consuming. Um, And that's a route that not a lot of leaders take. Yeah, he put he he wanted to put in the work up front. Um, Another another comment he made was the only constant from one interview to the next was my opening question. Are you happy doing what you're doing? And like coming into a company asking that question up front, you are creating work for yourself. Like that, that's one thing that yeah. in my current job, I work in an office, but when I go into the actual environment where all the employees are at, usually that results in more work for myself. He's just going straight to every single person and saying what needs to be fixed. Yeah. And that's like super admirable. Yeah. I'm a big believer personally that you can love any job um, in the right environment. Like I believe you don't live to work, you work to live, right? So I think a lot of people get hung up on like, this isn't the most, you know, this isn't what I'm most passionate about in life. I don't believe that has to be your job. Like, I believe you can pursue your passions living your life without it having to be like how you actually raise your family, right? Yeah. yeah. And it, you guys might disagree with that, but I think this question's so genius because everyone has potential to love where they are if they have the right leadership and someone willing to hit hear like what they don't like about the job and what they do like about the job it creates all sorts of opportunities about like well how can we make this place better like how can we make this a better environment for every single employee so that you don't go home every night thinking i hate my life because i hate my job you go home every night thinking i love my life and i enjoy my job yeah, yeah, 100%. And I think something that's important to note there is a lot of times we ask people, like, are you happy doing what you're doing? Or uh, you get asked that question, and the immediate thought is maybe, no, I'm not. Like, I need to quit and go work for a nonprofit or, yeah. like, go find my passion job. But, no, that's not really the case. Like, maybe maybe you don't love what you're doing, and mm-hmm. there's something you can fix, like, yeah. where you're at to make that a change. And so uh, I think just stopping and asking people that question is very revealing. Well, and so this is, we're talking about Nintendo here. He's going to every single person. Do you, and all three of us are in, in different variations of potential or current leadership positions. Is this a tool that you would consider ever implementing? Because like, this is the top level person. This is the president who's reaching out. Do you ever see yourself doing something similar to this? Because he's talking about later, he has a quote where he's in this context talking about data. And like, this is data to him in some way. And he wants to analyze that data to, to respond better. And yeah. that's consistent throughout this whole book is that he's very data-driven, fact-driven, and he wants to respond to it. So I, I kind of pivot that question to you guys. Would you implement this? Do you want to implement this? Yeah, absolutely. I, I've definitely had bosses who would, I would describe as the opposite of Iwata. 
And, you know, I, like in my current role, I'm, I'm kind of being pruned for leadership and I'm always trying to grab onto things that I think are super valuable for the future of the company because I care about it. And I think part of having a successful team is, is getting people on board with the vision of the company, right? And getting people to also care about the company. And if you have a bunch of disgruntled people that don't want to be there, yeah, I mean, it's, it doesn't matter how good of a leader you are, right? There's just no coming back from that. And so yeah. um, I think that's, I think it's genius. Yeah. So backing up a bit, this was from chapter one. This chapter's title is called Iwata future president. So I think it's kind of alluding to some of his skill sets and kind his of where philosophy. A lot of people listening might find themselves is like, I'm in a, I, I have all these options in front of me and I can, I can go in all these different routes. And so I think this is an important chapter for a lot of younger people to read Yeah, because these are, these are wisdoms that we should be carrying with us our whole career, right? If we ever find ourselves in management or in a leadership position, or even maybe not necessarily leading a full team, but there's someone who's working alongside you, just being able to communicate and talk about what you enjoy about the job and helping them make it a better place for themselves. And listen, and listening, like and listening's listening. key here. Yeah. yeah. So next up, we have a quote that Ryan highlighted. This is about going out, going out on a limb is easier with support and friends. Yeah, so I think the context of this was Iwata was making games and a friend from high school was like mm-hmm. playing what he was making and yeah. really enjoyed it. He was using his calculator, right? Yeah, he was that's like, right. Yeah. He was like programming on First, his calculator, these simple yeah. games. And, and he had a friend that really loved what he was playing. And so Iwata was saying, as human beings, unless we have someone to complement our work and enjoy what we've created, we're not apt to go out on a limb, which is why meeting this friend in high school had such a positive effect on the course of my life. And I think that's, I think that's profound. And I think that that applies to a lot of areas of our life, right? If you like put all of your passion and effort into something that no one will ever see, it's harder to believe in it, right? Like as much as we want to believe we don't care what other people think, we want to bring joy and we want to bring things to the table and create and uh, provide that for other people. And so it's, I thought that was so interesting. It's like when you're making something that someone can appreciate, it's like, that sticks with you for the rest of your life. Yeah, and, and when I read it, I was actually thinking too about the other side of that, that friend. Uh, you know, because I was like, man, how many times in my life, uh, maybe if I was a little bit more intentional or maybe if I just went out of my way to check what someone was doing, that I could be that person that's like, hey, no, that's really cool. You got something going here, man. Like, uh, you know, or you're really talented at this. You know, you should do that and, and just encourage her or encourage him and like tell them how awesome something is that they're doing. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, both sides of that coin, I was like, Man, it, it's so simple, but that is that is profound. Yeah, 100%. And I take it from actual like a Bush League perspective. Like this resonated with me from like when we record something and one of our friends reaches out and like, I liked that or that was cool. That's why we do this. Like it's at everything. the end of the day, right. it's not, we'd love to grow Bush League, but these little things of like, we do it because like we support each other and we love it. So I took it from like a very direct personal route on that one. Yeah. So the next quote I actually highlighted, this is about, Kirby's Dreamland and some Love some deep knowledge and history on Kirby's Dreamland. And this is a game that I actually loved. I think I originally played it because I think it was on the was it published on NES maybe at the time or SNES. I think I played it on the Game Boy, right? Didn't it come to the Game Boy eventually? Yeah. It so sounds right. the quote is the company, and at the time this was Hal, got a lucky break and managed to spring back to life with Kirby's Dreamland. It was originally slated to come out on Game Boy under the title Twinkle Popo, but Shigeru Miyamoto told us this game deserves more attention. So we put off its release and made a few tweaks and fixes, and eventually it was reborn as Kirby's Dreamland, the first game in what became the Kirby series from Nintendo. Like it came, this was a third party, like second party Nintendo game. Kirby was. Yeah. Now, HAL eventually is absorbed into Nintendo as a kind of a secondary studio, mm-hmm. but at the time, you know, I think of Kirby and I think Nintendo. Yeah. And oh, a, yeah. this was a, you know, Twinkle Popo was the original title. Twinkle Popo, yeah. yeah. Some random third party that Miyamoto just happened to pick up and love. Right? Yeah. And again, that's, it's, we, you start hearing throughout this book, you hear names you recognize to this day. Yeah. Miyamoto, Sakurai. Like, there's a reoccurring theme that these are the founding fathers of, of our Nintendo. Right. And that, that's what I loved about it. Yeah. One thing, too, and we may talk about this later, but you see this, it's a reoccurring theme. And it also made me step back and go, man, maybe I really don't understand how game development happens. But <laughs> it was how many times, like a project, 
w- like started and went one direction and just stopped and got scrapped or yep. just stopped and went a completely oh different direction. Gosh. And like you realize that, you know, sometimes as gamers, we can get pissed because a game didn't come out at like a certain date. And it's like, we have no idea that on the background, they may get 75% done and be like, you know, this, this visionary leader, or this, this director running it goes, it needs to go a different direction yep. and, and just completely goes a different way. And we're which, like, whoa, you know, which teaser, uh, mother earthbound we'll get there. That's in a later yeah, chapter. Yeah. And it yeah. talks in detail about that. I love yeah. it. So next up, this is a quote from Nick. I was curious why you selected this one, Nick. So it's about Iwata's kind of college experience. Yeah. So the quote is my, my college coursework helped me understand the basics of computing. I'm glad I went, but most of the work that I did later on was a continuation of the things I taught myself. Uh, and so for me, this is a big one. It probably just resonates because I went to college, dropped out, and uh, almost everything that I've done has been kind of just self-taught. Not in the sense that like, you know, I sat down and taught myself, but it's been like, oh, that book's interesting. Let me grab that and read yes. it and consume more, or let me ask questions. Let me just find people that are smarter than myself. And so um, I thought it was interesting that he said that, and I, I think it just speaks to like if you're hungry to learn and grow and, and, and obtain knowledge, like you're going to do that. Yeah. Rather you have a, you know, a master's degree or, you know, whatever that looks like, or you're going to school, like that option's up for you. And so that just resonated with me. Which when you sent that quote over, I was like, I think this is where Nick is going yeah. with this. And sure yeah. enough. And like, dude, you are the most self-taught person I know. I had to be forced into learning things education wise. You sit there and find a book, you find a website, you read everything. I do appreciate that about you because like you take for granted your education. Like I know in high school, like oh, yeah. I would do anything to get out of reading a book and yeah. like yeah. get around that, right? <laughs> and I know like I would have you been were a kid too, too though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Totally went Same around thing. that. But as an adult, you just were like, I want to know as much as possible about this. And then you would dive in and you yeah. would learn about it. And it, it's exactly what Iwata was talking about. It's like He's glad he went to college, but he was making games on calculators. You know yeah, what I mean? Like yeah, well before all this. And that was him just dinking around and, and solving problems. How, how many right. stories do you hear like, oh, I, I learned this in my garage and now it's this yeah. giant company. So I, I loved that quote. That was a good selection. Uh, next up is one that resonated with me, kind of on the same front, but for different reasons. The teaser for this is the perspective of the week. So the quote is, when I was little, I was sick a lot and had asthma. And after I switched schools, I was bullied for a while. Through these experiences, I saw the world through the eyes of the weak. My first job happened to be a small company that was weaker by comparison than larger companies. But seeing the world through the eyes of the weak was an incredibly valuable experience for me. Even after becoming president of Nintendo, which was far from a weak position, I could never lose sight of my early experience, nor do I look back on those hard times and feel any resentment whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I see asthma and I go, I had asthma. I had really bad (laughs) asthma as a kid. So that was like the first thing. But I also was like the smallest kid all the way up until like my sophomore year of high school. Were you? Yeah. And that's yeah. And tall you, now. Exactly. Yeah. You say that because I'm tall now. And it's something that I still to this day and reading it, I never really connected the dots. But to this day, I still feel like I'm the shortest guy <laughs> sometimes. And it doesn't matter. It, like, it, but yeah. like, it's like it plays into your psychology, my yeah. psychology. Yeah. So like growing up and like it's the perspective of the weak and uh, it's the underdog aspect. And even he says Nintendo, it's not far from the weak position, but Nintendo is kind of the small guy when you look at Sony and you look at Microsoft, these yeah. big multimedia companies. Yeah. So I loved this quote. I re- it resonated a ton with me. Not to, not to outdo you. Oh, okay. You had, did you have double But ass? in second grade, I will never forget, Jesse Elms <laughs> oh. made fun of me for having Velcro shoes in second <laughs> oh, grade. Oh, dude. And I've never <laughs> forgotten that. And I am very intentional with the shoes I buy now. Say, I'm looking at it shoes. has literally like changed the course of my life in the way of like I care about what I wear footwear. Like I care about the shoes that are on my feet because that stuck with me. Yeah, it's it's weird the things that stick. <clears throat> yeah, right. That's really weird because today I was at uh, Tilly's and they had some Velcro Vans. And I pulled them off the shelf, and they said, kids. Oh. <laughs> and I, I asked he's, the guy. He's connected both our worlds, yeah, the rest shoes the guy. and being small, right? I asked the guy that was working, I said, what's the biggest kid size you have? And he's like, a six. And I'm like, darn. Can I try it on? <laughs> <laughs> he brought it out. It was just too short. I love it. That's so awesome, man. next up is a quote from Nick. This is talking about bankruptcy and kind of the psychology behind bankruptcy. Yeah, let me uh, let me read this, see if it sparks a little bit more too. Let's put it this way. If your company is on the brink of bankruptcy, all you can see as one of its employees is a heap of problems. After all, it's only natural to look at things and say, 
is this what happens when we take orders from corporate? So I think this was under the uh, context of him coming in. Was he still at Hal or? Yeah, I think yeah, it was he was Hal. still at Hal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. A lot of debt. Yeah, he took debt. over that position with. Uh, it was in. It was in. A, it wasn't in USD. It was in yen. Yen. And so I don't understand the the amount, but it was a massive debt. And uh, essentially, he was just talking about that being one of the biggest things that he faced coming in, and how much he learned from that. Uh, and I think some of this also resonated with me too, the psychology of uh, of employees. And when you're at the bottom and you just hear that your company's in debt, um, like there's a lot of times you're thinking like, what's going on? Is it like, are there actually people up there or is there just corporate making like bad decisions? They're so disconnected from what's actually happening down here. And so uh, this just kind of resonated with me a little bit too, especially recently going through like a big acquisition for a small company. And so, uh, you know, big companies come in, they make different decisions. And and sometimes when you're at the bottom of the organization, those things are kind of frightening and you don't really know what's going on. And I think what he's really trying to address here is the uh, human aspect of coming in, uh, being a human, talking to people, trying to really figure out what's going on with problems, uh, you know, opposed to just cost cutting or doing whatever the, you know, the accountant says you should do. And so, yeah, that stuck out to me. I thought that was uh, just a, it revealed how he was looking at some of those problems and how other people were feeling. He, mm. he consistently thinks from every level of the company yeah. throughout his career, at least from this book, he was thinking about the little guy up to the president and up to middle management. Like he yeah. was always considering those people. Yeah. So uh, a quote, or at least an aspect I, I brought up earlier is that he has a, a background in development. So this is, this is a quote from him. Since my background is in development, I am better able to understand the mind of someone working in development than the average executive. And mm. this again resonated so much. I, I was a benchtop scientist for you know half my career at this point, And I made a transition to administration or leadership. And I carry with me like that knowledge of benchtop science and kind of the, the technical aspect. And I, this resonated to me personally, because I think Ryan, you're in a similar boat too, but I I do feel like it's, it it brings value when you are making decisions that affect people on the technical level, you should understand the technical aspects. So I I loved that quote. I I brought it up also because of you, Ryan's in a similar boat, but not bench up science, but engineering. Yeah. I think there's nothing more frustrating than someone above you, like speaking as if they know better what you've been doing for years. Right. And it's not that they don't have the right to tell you what they think. Like everyone, especially leadership, has that right. Sure. But you you feel ultimately, you feel like unsupported when it's like everyone wants to feel like they're the specialist because they are, you know, like yeah. specialists should be treated as specialists. And so I just, yeah, I totally agree. I think that's super interesting that I think leadership should have a really good grasp on what everyone in the company does. Yeah. And not just from like, not just because they want to, but they should like spend time with that person. And kind of what we're talking about earlier is like having those conversations of like what day to day is like for everyone. Obviously for bigger corporations that that's not feasible, but they have managers that can relay all that information to them. Or systems. Yeah. And like this, this wasn't addressed in the book. I I did some other outside research beyond the book because I just fell in love with Iwata after this. So I watched some documentaries on YouTube and one of them talked about how he was in the trenches coding as president, like he would go like at Hal, he would go in and help get these projects out the door by coding. Like that's nuts. Mm -hmm. So I think just from a morale perspective, that brings in your employees who are like, Hey, the boss is right next to us. He's sitting here coding better than me. Right. Like they say he's a phenomenal coder. Well, yeah. So I was going to actually just, I was going to say spoiler alert. I don't know again, if we're going to talk about this later, but I don't know how you guys were. I didn't pick it up till the end of the book when Miyamoto and Atoyo were talking. They really made it, they really made it obvious that he was actually really good at programming yes. and was always humble about it. Yes. At the front of the book, he's just like, oh, I programmed and obviously I led these projects and I was good. But uh, there was a real emphasis on the back end of like, no, he was like really good about this and he was very humble about it. And he actually just enjoyed sitting down, reading other people's code yes. and trying to understand where they were coming from when they wrote that code. And so yeah, it sounds like he was a real just whiz there on the programming side. Mm. And again, that's the leader. That's the president. That's the leadership. So next up, I have a quote from you, Nick, and this is something I highlighted as well, but I want, want to have you read it. It's about innovating while remaining profitable. Ooh, yeah, yeah. Hot topic here with uh, Nintendo. So if a president says that they'll revolutionize the industry, but for the next five years, the company won't be able to turn a profit, they'll find themselves without a job. And so every year, they need to generate a steady stream of profits, but they also need to innovate. It's like flying along in an airplane and working on repairs mid-flight. 
Yeah, I don't I don't really know where to start here, but I think um, if we've ever said anything negative uh, about Nintendo or any or griped about it all, it all comes around this issue of what we uh, what we think of as consumers in America here as like them doing things that are profit centered, right? Yeah. It, it doesn't seem like there's people over profit. A lot of times with Nintendo, it seems like there's profit over people. And so we, we briefly touched on this at the beginning that we feel like this book has given us a little bit more insight into how they think. Yep. But I think he's just making a point here that like, look, you have to be realistic. You cannot be a president of a, of a massive company like this and also not make a profit. So whatever that looks like, like you can come in and say, I'm innovative and I have this experience and we're going to do these big things. But like if those, if those detract from actually making a profit as a company, you're just not going to be the president for no, long. No. Uh, you're going to be kicked out very quickly. And I, what I think is so interesting about that is it's not necessarily true for everyone. What do you mean? Yeah. Well, Microsoft mean? is not at all that way. They don't innovate. They don't. Well, and they, they, will, they will lose money. Like the CEO, Spencer, has like made decisions where, you know, Game Pass is an investment. I, there's no way they're making much money on Game Pass. No, no, no. It's, I'm sure they're it's just, not profitable. Yeah. They're just like shoveling subscriptions in as fast as they can because they know long term this is this is the future of gaming yeah and so i think it's so interesting because nintendo and sony are very similar like these two japanese companies that are they keep it smaller keep it slimmer and they uh produce incredible works of art but they're always going to turn a profit like at the bottom at the end of every year it's like turn the profit or you're out. They have to. Yeah, they have to. And they're smaller. Like they don't have the support of this mother company that's just Microsoft, shoveling Microsoft, money yeah. in. Yeah. And like that's one thing that came out of this book for me is that I empathize a little bit more now with Nintendo. I look at the Skyward Sword collection or whatever it is, Skyward Sword Remaster, and I go, this is to fund the next Breath of the Wild. Yep. Like they're going to release these half games that aren't fully like, it's not what I want. But people will buy it. It's going to get back to Nintendo. They're going to get money from that that will then fund the innovation. You have to have these easy revenue sources to then fund big games, like the big risk games like Breath of the Wild. So it's not forgiving it. It's understanding it, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I also think it's understanding some of their philosophy, and this seems to be true to Nintendo. I, I think as of 2019, you can find research that says they have under 6,000 employees. Yeah. That's shocking yeah, it's for Nintendo. Low. And then in the book uh, at the back, I, I believe it's Miyamoto. Maybe a toy talks about going out and having ramen with. Yeah. And he talks about like, that wasn't a, a, that wasn't a Nintendo thing for them to dine on like company money. So like they ended up splitting the checks personally like for the rest of the the history. And so it's like Amazon. When you read about Amazon in their beginning years, Jeff Bezos had people uh, like picking up doors that were like five bucks uh, uh, like at Home Depot and they would sit those those doors on top of things. Desks. That would be desks. Yeah, desks. Yeah, and I it's like there's this frugality built into mm. Nintendo and it's just like a philosophy that they've ever that they've always had. And so I think that runs parallel to the to the profit conversations and the leadership will, there. I'd push back on that just a bit because as a consumer, obviously that doesn't have to be communicated. Nintendo doesn't owe us an explanation. Sure. But as a consumer, it's hard not to feel taken advantage of when this game that you've now bought two or three times <laughs> is full price. Or is leaving the store in really three months. Really done much work. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's yes. like they could do what they could do is like offer more games. Yeah. That are literally emulated. Like all the work is already done. Like they could old offer a ton more older games with minimal work. For a cheaper price and just yeah. you know and and so i know there's there's always things we don't understand like i i had no idea that that's how iwata saw this company but yeah it, it it i do understand it better and it makes sense why they do that but it's still it it doesn't feel right yeah. from the consumer's point of view sometimes and you're like this game is 10 years old yeah no but yeah those, it, and those it, things don't change it doesn't forget right. yeah it, i we understand a little bit more when when we can afford these things then you're just like yeah i guess you know it's it's like it's weird. Iwata like, addresses this later down the road. Yeah, yeah, about like prices and changes. Oh, I can't wait. It makes okay, me we'll think of uh, Jeff Grubb's article. Oh, yeah. about that's Nintendo, you can do better. Of, yeah. yeah, yeah. So the next is from Ryan. So this is about what type of company Iwata wants to work for. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he says, uh, "Ask me what sort of company I would want to work for, and I would say a place where my boss understands me, or mm-hmm. a place where my boss cares about my quality of life." And I thought that was awesome because we kind of talked about this. He's like. 
we want a boss that knows how hard our job is, right? That knows what it takes to get this report out or this job out or whatever your task is. We want them to understand the skin you have in the game because when they don't and they're adding that pressure, it feels like, like how much harder could I work? Yeah. You know, we hit these ceilings where if they don't understand correctly what your role is, um, we get burnt out yeah. really quickly. And I thought it was interesting that he says, or a place where my boss cares about my quality of life. So if they don't understand your role necessarily, because sometimes it's hard, right? These you, bigger companies, it's hard to know what everyone does everything, daily. No. Yeah. At least they're, they're making it clear like, hey, personal life comes first. Yes. Like the priorities in your life are your family. The priorities in your life are like the responsibilities you have to your kids, to your wife, to you know, your spouse, whatever. I think that's interesting. It's like it is an or statement and either of those can fill that gap. Well, in, in an industry that constantly talks about crunch and, yeah, you crunch know, time. not having work life balances, at least. And I, I can't speak to Nintendo's actual what actually happened, but at least from a philosophical standpoint, if this is what the leader, this is what the president is saying, that's huge. It will ripple. Yeah. It will ripple to some extent down. Yeah. And uh, I think it's really easy. I don't know. Maybe some people will look at some of these things and say, well, maybe that's industry or maybe that's cultural. But like, I think it really comes down to just being a good leader or yeah. a good boss it's and saying person. like, hey, are my employees healthy? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Am I working them 80 hours or not? And if so, like maybe we should change that. Absolutely. You know, it's that simple. So the last quote from chapter one is from Nick. This is about listening to frustrated people. Yeah. So the more frustrated someone is, the more important it becomes to listen to them. Unless you make a point of this, anything you try to say goes in one ear and out the other. If you interrupt them mid-sentence and say, it's more like this, it's only natural for them to think, this person has absolutely no clue what I'm saying. Uh, and I think this just goes to the active listening we mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. It was clear that he was very good at listening. Yeah. Um, and actively listening is, is tough. It's tough for me. Uh, I think it's tough in this this generation where we're so distracted with noise but in general you have to be intentional about listening and i think the point here is that like if if someone's talking and you're like mid-sentence thinking about how you're going to respond to that like you're not listening yeah. you're thinking about what you're going to say and the impact your conversation is going to have and what so, were you saying yeah yeah i uh, hold on. are you done hold, hold on, I have I have hold on. can you repeat that <laughs> yeah exactly so i mean man it's just for him to say things like this he truly gets that like man shut up and listen to people and when people are griping more that's just a sign that there's that you should listen even more that's yeah. a, that's an even bigger red flag and totally. so listen i feel like you understand that more than anyone too of just being an hr People are bringing that to you always, right? And so you, you, you're in a role specifically where listening is key. And I mean, for you to think how important that is, it, it, it speaks volumes because I think that's, that's crucial for any sort of role that you, you would be in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes things are like a thermometer. You know, and when you hear more than once or when things are getting higher and higher, it's like, oh, hey, maybe there's something going on here. Yeah. And so I should, I should really make time for that. Absolutely. Mm. So that's chapter one. And oh oh, wow. that's chapter one. This is a rich, dun, dun, rich dun, dun, book. Dun. So we're going into chapter two. The title of this chapter is The Leadership of Awada. The first one, the first quote is from something that I highlighted. It's about the simplistic purpose of a company. I've never thought about it like this. I did attend business school and no one ever said it like this. And I love this. After all, the whole point of a company is for regular people, each with their distinctive characteristics, to join forces and accomplish giant tasks they could not undertake alone. I love that. I do, like yeah. it's, it's simplified what a firm is, what a company is. And it's just like, it, it's, it highlights the aspect that I lose sight of. And it's something he alludes to later about cloning himself. And I love this quote later. But it's basically like everyone brings something different to the table. Respect that honor that and like utilize that you're not like me i'm not the perfect employee there's things that i'm not good at and i need to find the other people who compliment me in the context of this book miyamoto the perfect compliment to awada and we're going to yeah. go into that deeper and deeper throughout yeah. the book but like finding out what other people's skills are and leveraging those against yours like it's it's that's how business should be ran I right. love that. Yeah, what if you just got your team together and said, you're a doctor, you're an engineer, you're a chemist, you're a scientist, you're a business person. The mission is to solve X. Now, how do we get there? Yeah. You know, like just literally cutting through the red tape and saying, this is the mission. Everyone's different. How do we get there? Yep. I love it. Yeah. And you don't ever want to get in that danger of like, I guess, stepping on someone else to get to a different point because everyone is there to support everyone. You know what I mean? Like every role is a 
as important to you as your own role. And so, yeah, I, I feel like building an effective team, it's, it's super important to understand that. Yeah, totally. The next quote is something Nick highlighted. It's about the importance of finding bottlenecks. Mm, bottlenecks. The trouble is that people feel better when they have their hands full. So until they find the bottlenecks, they tend to sweat over whatever issues they encounter. Before taking any action, you should identify the most problematic areas and figure out what you and only you can do to fix them. Yeah, I just think this is, uh, you know, especially for me, a busy body with notes uh, and checklists. You should just kind of take things down, take inventory and prioritize them and put them in order. And I think uh, humans in general like to stay busy. But yeah, what uh, what are you doing that actually moves the needle? And that's kind of prioritizing the things that have to get done. Yeah, no, I like that one it's too. probably a big programmer thing too. Yes, that's another thing is that he was really good at finding um, where basically code is broken or condensing code. I remember reading this that this was not in the book, but he was really good at someone would say like, oh, there's too much code. We can't fit this on the cartridge. And he would be able to like go in and like cut it down by yeah. half in some cases. So Ryan, this next one's from you. And I actually highlighted this as well. I love this philosophy. It's his philosophy on job interviews. I'm surprised Nick didn't highlight this. I think, did you not? I don't know. Go ahead, go ahead and read it, Ryan. So he says, in my experience, there are two types of interviewers. Those who make a person feel at ease in order to get a sense of who they really are and judge their candidacy accordingly. And those who believe an unrelaxed person, though unable to speak their mind, will reveal all kinds of things about themselves, like how sociable or strong they are. And then he goes on and says, apart from what made you, he's talking about like questions he likes to ask, apart from what made you join the company, there's another question I like to ask. Out of all the work you've done so far, what is the most interesting thing and what was the most painful? So both of these sentences were, I thought were so awesome because he took the approach of he's the interviewer that would like everyone to be calm and to understand like when they're comfortable because that's the environment he's trying to make. And I think he's arguing that you can actually teach someone to handle those stressful situations better. Yeah. Like you don't need to know how adept they are already yeah. because under your leadership and under like a comfortable environment, they can reach that point of yeah. being able to handle that well. Yes. Yeah. Maybe you start the interview out with like, hey, tell me what your hobbies are. Tell yeah. me about your family and your friends, what you love to do. Not, uh, so tell me well, how you would build out a recruiting funnel yeah, in so, 13 days, and Nick, you know. So Nick and I just like within weeks of this podcast recording changed jobs. Like yeah. We both accept the new jobs at different companies. Went through multiple interviews. Did, and I, I can say for myself, and I'm curious for you, I went through both of these. I went through people who liked to make me feel, made me feel comfortable during an interview where I was able to be myself and kind of show who I am. And then I went through people who were kind of these stark, really dry, kind of makes you uncomfortable just to see how you, you know, yeah. you cringe a little bit. And like when I interview people, I'm the one that's like, Hey, like I see there's a Taylor Swift sign in your background. You like Taylor Swift? Like, what do you think of her new album? Like, I think there's so much more value in being that type of person, like yeah. Iwata. I'm curious, did you encounter any of this recently? Yeah, I got both ends of the spectrum. Yeah. Uh, and it's funny, the position I ended up accepting, the place I'm with now, it was super relaxed and comfortable. And uh, it, was, it was just a great experience from the start, which allowed me to kind of open up and actually be myself, where I felt really, really rigid in uh, some of the other interviews that I did. So moving on from that, I think that one stood out a bunch to me just because yeah. our recent personal circumstance. The next one, and there's a couple of quotes, I'm not going to read all of them, but there's a couple of reoccurring themes throughout here about changing business strategy or changing Nintendo's business strategy. And I'm going to read one of them. It, again, it's reoccurring. But the first one is, while I'm interested in making a large number of changes, I don't make changes from a spirit of rejection. Rather, my feeling is this. If I was at Nintendo in the old days, I would have taken the same course of action that led to what we're doing now. But times have changed. The world has changed around us. If we don't change to what's going to happen, should we take a path of gradual obscurity or should we take the path of future, enabling more people than ever to enjoy the things we make? And another quote that bleeds into this is that, you know, you can be on top for so long, but you can only be on top for so long until you have to change something. Yeah. And Nintendo does this to a fault, like 100% to a fault. Oh, They'll yeah. be on top with the Wii and then make the Wii U. And you're like, <laughs> why did you do that? Like right. you were on top, you completely changed what, like what the appeal was. And then they come out the, the, the DS or the 3DS and then you have the 2DS and like they make all these innovative changes because they know that if they just kept the status quo, 
they're going to be caught, like someone's going to catch up. Yeah. Which is true. And I, I've actually written a blog post about this on the website, but it's kind of like about their greatest strength is also their greatest weakness. Yeah. Which is kind of like a, it was a killer article. Clickbait, right? Killer. But it's kind of like some of the things about Nintendo is they're always, they want, they desire so many different games that they leave some very valuable franchises in the dust. And yeah. like, there's a lot of things they've done where you're like, oh my gosh, like bring this to the next level, bring this to the next generation. Like F-Zero X is just like, it's just an example of like games that people really loved yeah. and they kind of refused to go back to that. And I remember seeing this interview, I think it was with Miyamoto where he was like, we already made F-Zero X. So go play it. But I'm like, not everyone has access to an N64. You yeah. know what I mean? Like yep. it's, it's just, it's hard for me to wrap my head around because in so many ways there are visionaries, but they don't see why people sometimes want the same thing. They don't see why Call of Duty sells so well. It's like the same repackaged type of game over and over and over. <laughs> yeah. They're not interested in making that, which they probably could and yeah. people would love it. I, lo- I mean, I, this, this quote stood out to me so much because it does speak to our frustrations again. Yeah. We are understanding where Nintendo comes from. We're not, we're not forgiving it, but we understand it. Yeah. yeah. So the next one is, this is something both you and Nick, and, and myself actually too, I teased it earlier. The concept of, you know, we've all said this or we know someone who said this. Oh man, I could get so much more done if I could just clone myself. If there are yeah. two or three or four of me, I'd be so much more efficient. And he speaks to that. Ryan, I, I, I want you to read this first quote uh, on that topic. On a side note, years ago, when I was a whole lot younger and felt a crazy sense of urgency, I used to tell myself, I wish I could clone myself three times over. Looking back, however, I recognize this thought was arrogant and narrow-minded. Our differences are what make each of us so valuable Mm. and give life meaning. I'm embarrassed that I ever thought this way. Yeah. And I thought it was so interesting that he's embarrassed he thought that way. Because I have thought that. Uh-huh. I have literally 100%. sat at work before and thought, like, I wish I could, I wish there was two of me to get this done. And it is narrow minded. Like, there's, there are, those, that's an area where I could ask for help. Yeah. And that's an area where someone else is better equipped than me. And, and I don't want to admit it. Yeah. And he's humble enough to say that. Like, hey, I'm embarrassed yeah. that I said that. Well, and then yeah. Nick highlighted a quote, basically, and I'll summarize it's a longer one, but it's basically talking about that everyone has different skills. And people see things differently than you. And that is a perspective that you need yep. when making decisions and operating as, as a company. So mm. again, the wisdom, it just doesn't stop with him. It really doesn't. This term, the, the idea of cloning yourself, I've never heard someone critically like shoot that down. Yeah. And that, now I'll never say it again. Yeah. <laughs> Breaking I'll, news, Nintendo has figured out how to clone people. Yeah. And they choose not to because it's not. <laughs> they choose people. not to. They have the power, but they deny themselves. So he also talks about on welcoming, welcoming criticism and handling people with care. So Ryan, you highlighted both you and Nick. Uh, Ryan, I want you to start with your quote and then Nick, you follow up with yours. New hires always seem to be divided between those who welcome criticism and those who don't. Those people whose actions you can safely criticize and those who have to call out with the utmost care. Yeah, and then uh, next was you might realize that somebody is making a mistake, but unless you can advise them in a way that they can readily accept and comprehend and fit into their point of view, your advice, right or not, is meaningless. And like my takeaway, and you guys can correct me on this, but my takeaway from both of those are that treat everyone differently. Like in the sense of this person handles criticism better, this person doesn't, this person needs uh, feedback in this way, this person doesn't. And it's just, again, him when you know your employees and you sit down and listen, you know how to talk to people in the way that they receive it best. Yeah, and if you're not yep. willing to intentionally figure out what that is in each person, probably shouldn't be leading. Probably goes for children as well, I would imagine. I guess. What do you mean? I mean, every, every child needs to be addressed differently. Like yes. you have like the older sibling. Oh, you're right. Like, yes, yeah, for sure. Needs you to yell at them I wasn't and wants sure that which, discipline. Which one? there's like, a, I'm the middle <laughs> child, so like, we're, we need a little bit more affirmation than probably our siblings do. Yeah. And, and then the younger, younger child doesn't beaten. need anything. Yeah. yeah. Just... See, and like, I'm raising one kid right now. So there's only one way I know something, but I know when we have a second kid, I'm going to be like, oh, this is different now. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah. Well, so this doesn't work. let's move on to chapter three. This chapter is titled Iwata, the individual. So the first thing that stood out to me on this is, is earthbound again. So the, one of the co-creators of Earthbound, his name is Shiga, Shiga, Shigesato Itoi. He's reoccurring in the book again. He's a friend of Iwata. Kind he of has, like a mentor of his. Yeah, right. right yeah. And he was at, I think he was at, I don't know if he was at Hal, but nonetheless, Iwata described him having the ability to see the future, 
And the quote is, I'm always asking a toy, how do you know half a year out this would be so popular without fail? A toy answers the same way. I don't predict the future. I simply notice the world's starting to change a little before everybody else does. And I like that just because from a game maker's perspective, sometimes, you know, game development takes three, four, five, you know, it can take a long time. You have to know in advance where the industry is going three or four years in advance to know what to make. Yeah. Because if you make something based off current trends, you're going to be behind by the time you actually can put it out. Yep. Yeah. I mean, think about how many Greek games we have right now, right? <laughs> I mean, they're all, every game right now is Greek. I just feel like it's, I mean, it's a lot of it's Ubisoft's laziness. I'm just yeah, going to say that. Yeah. Isn't that so interesting, though, how many times he mentions, uh, not like him being a mentor, but how many times he like will take something from uh, Shiga, Shigasato? When you read, Nailed it. When you read Shigasato <laughs> at the end, it sounds like the complete opposite. Yeah. Like, like he was being mentored. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it? It's, it's just, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Like, and like really. Miyamoto's the same way too, <clears throat> where you hear a lot of praise in Miyamoto throughout the book. Yeah. But then Miyamoto talks about him like he was this, you know, yeah. amazing, noble person. And he was, but it's just cool to hear the different sides yeah. talking yeah. about each other. Yeah, absolutely. So moving on, I want to uh, jump to a, a quote about prioritizing what speaks, learn, prioritizing learning what speaks to you. And I think I thought of you again during this quote, Nick, but if you force yourself to study things that have no bearing on the world around you, the material will have no way of sinking in. So rather than waste your time, it makes far more sense to prioritize the things that you truly enjoy, whatever speaks to you. And like, that's what he went to college for like engineering because they didn't really have computer uh, like programming and whatnot. So he read this stuff on his own and he taught himself this stuff on his own. And like that, again, we talked about Nick a little bit with this, but Nick has completely found his niche of things that interest him and you just read a ton about it. So I liked that. I love it. I want to jump to my next quote let's hear in it. this chapter because this is so nintendo we've talked about what's the term that we talk about i don't know where you're going when a company has good oh goodwill goodwill yeah God, why couldn't i think of that goodwill we've talked about how nintendo is like invulnerable to criticism like yeah. there's nothing you can say that's going to make a dent in nintendo and you get a glimpse of why that is but it's it's spreading yourself thin Iwata says, either way, spreading yourself thin will get you nowhere. Same goes for companies. If you let the masses dictate your decision making, you're forced to cast a wide net and you won't be able to give individual projects the attention they deserve. Mm. As a result, the work lacks depth and the above all and above all has no secondary gains. And so this is where I felt most understanding of Nintendo and my gripes with them is like, you guys know retro gaming is so important to me and all the old backlog they have that is just sitting like no one's using it. And I always thought like, why will they not do anything with it? It's because if they divert any amount of energy to that, that's less energy on Breath of the Wild too. Yeah. And yep. so when it, you, you, know, you think about that in those terms, it's like they don't care what I want and they don't care what you want. They're just going to give you what they think is best. Yeah what is their best art and their best work. And so, yeah, it made sense to me. And it, it probably, this is probably the, the passage that I felt like best explained my gripes with Nintendo and gave them the best reason. Okay, yeah. I, no, I completely hear that because it's, to your point, Nick brought this up earlier, it's a small company. Right. <clears throat> they can only redirect resources so much. And they have a vision. Like at the end of the day, and Nintendo's thinking, hire me. Yeah. <laughs> and then I will emulate all your games. I mean, to be clear, it probably doesn't take that much to emulate. I mean, there's other things yeah. going on yeah. here. It doesn't but totally get them out. Well, if they're continually trying to innovate, don't innovate on recreating something you've already done. Yeah. And so it's kind of, and I don't know that innovation is one of their values. I think uniqueness is, but it's like, if, if they're just so set on their values and like one of those is innovation and being ahead of the curve, they probably start everything at that value section and then just go with it and say like the noise outside doesn't matter because yeah. we made this decision based on our values and we're going to create this game, uh, which is frustrating yeah. for yeah. the emulators. They're, they're going to do what they're going to do. Yeah. So next up is a quote that Nick highlighted. And I actually, I also, I also drew attention to this one too. So this one's about a thoughts on worry. Yeah. I've been thinking people waste time worrying about problems that can't be solved by worrying. If worrying would solve the problem, then I'd say, go ahead and worry. But somehow we can't stop ourselves, even when worrying solves nothing and leaves us empty handed. So there's two things to this. There's two things to this that like anxiety is a thing. Yeah. Anxiety that people struggle with is a thing. And maybe he didn't fully understand that. 
But at the same time, I do resonate with this quote a lot of when I tell myself when I'm worrying a lot, I go, oh, like this isn't, this isn't accomplish anything. Yeah. This is, this is making the situation worse, if yeah. anything. So like he's saying, yo, if, if worrying helps, do it, go ahead yeah. and do worry more. But if, since it doesn't, don't try not to worry. Now there's bigger problems that people struggle with when it comes to worrying and anxieties. But yeah. I, this one did stand out to me too. I, I wonder what you thought about it. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I'm thinking of a problem we had this week where we had someone call out and we just didn't have the staff to fill that position. So I just went in and worked that position in the office this week. But I remember sitting there kind of like just worrying about it, being upset. Like there was nothing I was going to do to get an, a, an extra staff member hired in eight hours to do that job. So it was like, okay, I can worry about this or I can just go, ah, oh, you know, bummer. I need to do this. I need to step up. I'm, I'm thankful I have a job, blah, 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 and, and do that because worrying was not going to help me. Uh, and I think that's an issue where sometimes, yeah, anxiety, a lot of that stuff is real and people have some serious stuff there and it's not to be, to be, you know, looked down at all. But I think sometimes if we just look at our worries and go like, can I, can I do, is this in my control at yeah. all? And if yeah. it's not, then maybe think twice about that. Like, yeah. That's what I, I liked do? about it a yeah. lot. So mm -hmm. next, this is a quote Ryan highlighted. Nick, I want you to listen very closely because you did not highlight this one, and I'm shocked. Okay, this is about Apple, Apple on me. and Nintendo. This is, an this is a lot of comparing uh, Nintendo to Apple. I almost sent this to you guys. Yeah, so yeah, it's a longer one. Ryan, Nick, listen, listen closely. Creating things that people can enjoy regardless of age, gender, or background. The stance I take... <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> he wrote cough. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The stance I take when carrying out the mission of Nintendo has certain things in common with ideas like the simpler the functionality, the better, or things should be easy to use, or when a customer has too many choices, they get confused. The corporate philosophy of Apple, or more specifically, the value system of Steve Jobs. On the other hand, Apple clearly specializes in technology while Nintendo focuses on entertainment. This results in a massive differences in priority. Make no mistake, I would without hesitation choose to make a product sturdier over making it 0.5 millimeters thinner. And I don't think Apple needs to subject the iPod to the sort of endurance testing where it's dropped repeatedly from the height of a bicycle basket. If Apple and Nintendo have something in common, it's increasing appeal through simplification. As you develop an idea, things begin to simplify. But on the whole, we're different because of differences in priority. Nick, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think it's pretty apparent when you just look at like the Nintendo Switch and an iPhone. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty different that, that there's two completely different values driving each one of those hardwares. And, you know, what he's saying there really is that like we're not in the hardware business really. Like we are, but our, our main goal is entertainment. Yeah. So our, our yeah. thoughts here are the Disney of, of gaming, you know, providing these, these memories and these experiences where Apple is definitely thinking about that stuff, right? Because they develop things that go into their hardware, but they're very design focused, very hardware focused. They, they test their products and, and want it to look a certain way and feel a certain way. And so, yeah, I, I took a screenshot of that. I meant to send it to you guys because I was reading it and I was like, oh, I know Straight. these guys highlighted this. And for the listener, if you don't know this, Nick is the biggest Apple head Apple you boy. could imagine. Yeah, he loves Steve Jobs. He's got a, his face tattooed on his back. But funny thing about this quote is it's a dated quote to me because when he's talking about Apple doesn't care about like how, how sturdy something is and testing it multiple times about how, you know, it can take a drop. They do do that now. Like yeah, the, he, time, he passed yeah. away in 2015. <clears throat> Obviously, his quote is prior to that. So this is probably in the Steve Jobs era when they were more, more focused on making things thin. But now there's a point of thin and durable. So I thought that was interesting. That kind of dated it. But yeah, it's differences in philosophy. There's some parallels. It's like that Venn diagram where like there is some overlap. Some things are overlapping. But at the end of the day, entertainment versus technology. Yeah. And Nintendo is not a technology company. This comes up a lot because they compete with Xbox and Sony who do lean more towards technology and hardware. Yeah. Nintendo is about entertainment. It's not about the hardware always. Well, how many times have I been just frustrated because I can play games now on my iPad with a controller and I'm like, man, I love the Switch, but like, it's not a 12.9 inch iPad. And like, why can't Nintendo just <laughs> release 4K, a skinny right. iPad? Well, the Pro's coming out. Yeah, well. Nintendo Switch Pro's coming out soon. So next up, that's chapter three. We're on to chapter four now. The title of chapter four is The People Awada Believes In. Ryan, I want you to start this off with mm. a quote or quotes about mother slash earthbound and its development. Yeah, so I think some background to the yep. development of earthbound was when he took over this project that he was put on, 
it was a nightmare. The game had no direction. They had for five years been working on the game and there was just, it wasn't coherent. Like nothing really made sense and it wasn't coming together. So they were worried that this whole project was going to tank five years lost to a wasted project. So he comes on and he, he has this quote where he says, working with what we have, it would take two years to fix things, fix things up. If we don't mind starting from scratch, we could be done in half a year. Yeah. I thought that was so interesting. Like being able to make that tough decision is sometimes the most timely decision. Like it would have been so much easier. Like walking away from all of that work would be so difficult to do, but sometimes it's necessary. Like you have to be able to swallow your pride and know this is the right decision to make. Well, he was disconnected too from the team. So like he can have that perspective of going hey, you guys need to scrap this and start new. Well, in yeah. the context to that, and you, you read at the end, because that was actually Atoya, right? That he came to. He, he, yeah. They were working together. Atoya was working so with him. He actually, in the context around that, just to speak into uh, Iwata's leadership and wisdom here, he actually came and presented that idea. Yeah. Like, hey, we, I'm going to give you the choice since it's your project. But like, it was kind of like a humble brag, like a humble, like, we could scrap this and be done in six months or we can continue what you've been doing and it'll be done in two years. And like he brought it up as like, I'm going to let you choose, even yep. though you're bringing me on to help. Because uh, you need and, buy-in. Yeah. You need buy-in from your employees right. and yeah. your colleagues. They have to come up with that decision. Yeah. So they decide it, with a toy support to scrap it. Ryan, read this next quote. From mm. start to finish, Earthbound was in development for almost five whole years. The first four years without me, in the last year with me helping out. So they were developing a game for four years, completely scrapped it. Iwata comes in, makes the game in a year. Yeah. And it's one of the most beloved games. Like, I've never played it, actually. It's but legendary. People love it. Yeah. Well, it was only released in Japan at first. And you can actually, like, get English versions, but it's it's very bootleg. I looked it up, and I was like, yes, I'm going to buy this one to Nintendo Switch store. And it wasn't on there. And I was like, oh, Of course no. it's not there. Yeah. yeah. Not yeah. I just didn't. Which is kind of shocking that it's not well, on I the... think um, like outside developers actually made a English version. I don't know that Nintendo well, isn't that ever the Earth, did. That's the Earthbound mother difference though. Earthbound is English, mother is the Japanese version, isn't it? That's my understanding. I, I don't. I, again, I haven't played the series, but I'm, not sure. I'm shocked it's not on the Nintendo Switch Online NES and SNES. Yeah, uh, emulator like on the Switch has like a Nexamon, like Pokemon type world feeling. Yeah, kind of. I, I, I would like, love. Oh, yeah, I would yeah. Love to play very Pokemon esque. Next up is a quote from that Nick highlighted. This one's about changing your point of view. Uh, yeah, usually when people spend a lot of time looking at something, they get closer and closer and lock themselves into a particular way of seeing. I think that sort of ideas that Miyamoto talks about, ideas that can solve multiple problems in one go become harder to find the closer you examine things. The sort of details you wouldn't notice unless you change your point of view or are lost on the, uh, unless you change your point of view or lost on the average person. I think this is speaks to some of the creative uh, yeah. and that's what he when he talks there about getting from Miyamoto but yeah just switching your view up maybe stepping back at certain times and saying hey I need to look at this from a different point of view it's applicable it's applicable to any career Anything, though yeah. because like if you're hyper focused on something you're looking so granular like it's you lose sight of the entire picture yeah. so sometimes coming in with a different point of view bringing someone in again this is he's a big proponent for multiple people coming in helping bringing their skills bringing their point of view and uh, again amazing at listening to people that goes right off the last quote you know uh they were probably four years in and just focusing on little things yes. and then brought someone in and said okay hey let's look at the project as a whole what needs to get done cut some of this yeah put this in start then, over yeah right next quote i want to go again this is something nick you you brought up so there's two quotes here they play into each other because it, it's somewhat contradictory but he has the philosophy that more is better the concept of more is better will never solve your problem so i'll read the first part and then, Nick, I want you to read the second quote uh, after we kind of flesh that out. So when it comes to games, most of the time, the concern is that they won't be interesting enough. A game that hooks players in all kinds of ways will capture their attention and, and be satisfying. Trouble is, you can only allocate so much time and personnel to a given project. With finite resources, telling people more is better will never solve your problems. We talked about this. Nintendo is a smaller company. They're kind of the underdog in some ways. They cannot just do more is better, right? Microsoft, Sony, they throw money into it. They fund things like crazy. Nintendo doesn't do that. Yeah, I remember being so upset with, uh, not so upset. Breath of the Wild is one of my favorite games of all time. Yeah. And I remember thinking, if they had just let us be the champions. Like, oh, I know. I, you I, always I, say I wanted that so bad. You always and, say But this. you don't think about, like, not only does 
they ha- now they have to program those champions as playable characters, but it has to make sense that you're them. They have to write that into the story. Yeah. They have to create things in the world that they can react with uniquely. That's a ton of work. Yeah. And, and it's like audacious to think that like they they could have done more thinking about all that they added yeah. into that game. You yeah. know what I mean? Like it's easy as a consumer to be like, Oh, there could be more. It's like, and no, there couldn't. They're Nintendo's kind of like the, the Kings of simplicity. When you look at their games, yeah. like yeah. it's, they, they, I've never, uh, and again, the next quote will say where they have done over the top, but in general, it's like always paired back. It's always like, and that there's beauty in that. Sometimes you play something, a Ubisoft game, play a Ubisoft, and I'm again, ripping off Ubisoft, sorry. Ubisoft <laughs> games are content sorry. more, 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 more. Like they throw in so much that I'm just like, I don't want this. There's yeah. waypoints. Yeah. Waypoint, waypoints, waypoint. right. And Nintendo's like, Hey, no waypoints. Just walk and see if you find anything. Yeah. Like, yeah, I love, love it. that. It's beauty. So, Nick, can you read this next quote? Because this, this is one game, one franchise, that more is better. Yeah, in general, I think that making a game bigger is oftentimes not the way to make it better. But with Super Smash Bros., I see things differently. It felt right to squeeze as much in there as possible, like some kind of bottomless vessel, the sort of game where quantity works. I love it. It's I think so that true. is a good, good option. So true. Because we've talked quite a bit on our podcast about just being tired of all the options, like having too many options. And you just said it. I think it's directly something we've said before. There's beauty and simplicity. Yes. And I think there's a revival of that coming back around. I and completely so, agree. And, and indies specifically, again, yeah. this, is, this all comes from constraint of resources. When you, when you can't just throw money at something, yeah. you have to get creative. And there's yeah. another quote that I love from him about that, but Smash is the exception. It, does. Smash, it only you, works because that's like the shtick of Smash. It's a mashup. Yeah. You know, it's like all your favorite characters, like who's going to make it in? Yeah, you know? it. I'm looking at so Ryan when we talk about Smash. Yeah, I love yeah. that game. Cool I, thing about Smash that I didn't realize too, think back to the N64. It, weird, I just got the chills talking about this because it takes me right back to my childhood, but booting it up. How Laboratories. It's How the, Laboratory. the, the wiener, wiener dog, dog with yeah, eggs. eggs, which oh made no gosh. sense. <laughs> That's Iwata. That's what Pokemon Iwata was Snap doing. Pokemon the same little intro. He, yeah. he was in, so like he was involved in Pokemon Stadium. Like he, he's been like pulling the strings of the games we love. Yeah, and he didn't... It's funny because they, they kind of explain later the creation of Mario Kart a little bit where he was making a totally different racing game. Yes. And it's like, why isn't this going to work? Like this isn't going to work. He had all the mechanics right. The programming was flawless. Well, Miyamoto comes in and is like, put Mario in the seat, right? Like, that's all they did is they just added Nintendo characters. And the, the combination of those two things worked. Like There's a racing Mario game. There, there are exceptions to the rule where more is better. But, like, more is better in the context of, like, using their IP, right? They have right. such a rich Disney IP yeah. that you want it all. Yeah. So, I don't know. I loved, I loved that dichotomy of... Yes, they don't believe more is, as Nintendo. They don't believe more is better, but there's some ex- exceptions where it's like Mario Kart and Super Smash Brothers. Next up is a quote that Ryan highlighted. It's the the broad sense is not repack- repackaging the same experience. Mm. Yeah, so this was uh, he's talking about Hiroshi Yamachi, and I think it was in terms of like designing the actual hardware. Yeah. Um, so Hiroshi Yamachi realized at a very early date that when you're creating a new piece of hardware. If all it does is repackage the same old gaming experience, it won't actually feel new and the gaming population won't expand. It doesn't matter if it's handheld console or a home console. If you make the same old thing, it won't have character. And if it lacks character, all you do is add to the competition. I love that last phrase. All you do is add to the competition because like we're kind of saturated in like PS5 and Xbox every iteration is probably just a little bit, it's like better graphics, better processing, better speeds, but it's not like revolutionizing your gaming experience. The controllers are pretty similar throughout, especially with Xbox, which I think has an amazing controller. It's super ergonomic and it's, love it. I love it. My favorite still. But he's saying like, why would we make a third Sony and Xbox, you know, the yeah. same controller, the same experience well, over and over. And it, it's shown in all of their hardware. They haven't had a single system since Nintendo 64 to GameCube was the last system where it was just a traditional controller. Still different though. Still completely different controllers. Yeah. Oh yeah. The controller design is totally different, yeah. but it, it was like the last typical controller, I guess yeah. you would say. And then ever since then, they've been on this saga of like amazing, weird experiments, really. Yeah. I love it. It's, yeah, it's, it's basically, again, that's Nintendo innovating. They'd never make the same thing twice. 
Xbox is okay with it. Sony's okay with it. And it works. And yeah. it works for them. And, but you're and just this, adding to the competition. It ties completely into this next quote that I absolutely love. So if you don't know, Blue Ocean Strategy, right? So Blue Ocean Strategy is a business term. It's basically, and, and Nick, I'll let you read this quote because you highlighted this, but the concept is that why go head to head with your competitor? Why not go this completely tangential direction where there's no one competing in the space? Nintendo has operated there their entire lifespan. They love it there. They go there and that's they occupy it. Playing so, their own game. Yeah, they do Nick, well there. Can you read that? <clears throat> yeah, Yamachi, the third president of Nintendo, used to tell us, if Nintendo tries to fight, it's going to lose. Don't waste your energy on fighting. In today's business parlance, this translates into the idea of blue ocean strategies. Don't do anything that's been done before. Yeah, I mean, it's... I think you just... This goes back to us getting insight into how Nintendo operates. And I think that... Do you have to continuously create something new to survive? Maybe not continuously. Like no. you should probably be be thinking about that every couple of years. But mm-hmm. like everything they do is about this, and it's just kind of like this. It's like they put this pressure on themselves to continue to innovate and make things new. And and I just I love that that's we're talking about a previous president that's built into the built into the culture, yes. into the philosophy there at yes. Nintendo. And like it's a business from that I learned. And I never connected it to Nintendo. This no. is this is Nintendo like thoroughly. This is what they do. Yeah. They never and like we brought it up before where they now Microsoft is choosing to do their own niche thing too. They're not going head to head with Sony anymore. Like this is how these games should be made. Don't sit there and compete because like at the end of the day, you're only going to have this nice microprocessor better than this other teraflop and whatever like whatever it is. Microsecond. Well said. Yeah. Well said. <laughs> do like, indubitably do do something creative. Do something unique. Game Pass is unique. Sony's like super triple A amazing games are unique. Nintendo is always doing unique things. So like that is blue ocean strategy. And I, I love seeing that. So the other thing yeah. is it's a quote from They're not gonna be Xbox. They're not gonna, they're not gonna don't right. expect them. And they're to not be gonna be Xbox. Sony with their yeah. amazing graphics and right. these amazing uh, teams. Yeah, this huge So the projects. last quote on that topic is don't do anything that's been done before. And again, it is Nint- Nintendo to a fault. They don't retread things that we love. They also innovate in things that we didn't know we wanted. Yeah. Last quote from this chapter. I love this. This oh, is a, it was so cool. Brian, I'm glad I, I'm glad this I get well. to read it. Yeah, you get to read this one. It's a perspective on Yoshi's origin. Mm. So Nintendo, the context is they're, they're never wanting to like waste anything. So a lot of the characters that we love were out of convenience of developing and programming. Like yeah. it just made more sense when it came down to pixels, really yes. is what it came down to. Yes. So he goes... One of the most interesting things about the way Miyamoto forms ideas is how he works from functionality. Rather than arbitrarily adding characters to a story, he starts off with a functional premise such as, this will be boring unless there's something here. This mode of thinking suggests the suggests the mind of somebody well-versed in industrial design. As one example, Miyamoto's idea way back when to have Mario ride on Yoshi's back in Super Mario World sprang from a place of functionality. To be specific, the Super Famicom system did not allow for us to display a large number of sprites, a a technical method for displaying graphical objects on the screen in a row. Yoshi is shaped the way he is in order to limit the number of sprites in a row when Mario is riding him. If you look at the diagrams for Yoshi, it's easy to see that he was designed purely from a place of functionality. We made Yoshi a dinosaur not because we wanted Mario to ride a dinosaur, but because the space we had in terms of functionality was shaped like a dinosaur. I I think that's amazing. Like if you look at that sort of L shape from Yoshi's head down his back and then like to his tail, it just fits Mario because they couldn't have this like giant dog, right? This long dog, like anything like that because they couldn't have that many pixels in a row. Like it didn't have the processing power. And so the fact that Yoshi's this strange shape, they're like, oh, that could be a dinosaur. Sure, let's go with that. Yeah. And it just became Yoshi. Like one of the most beloved characters of all Nintendo. If if the SNES had more power behind it, we might be writing uh, Yoshi the horse. Yoshi wouldn't exist. He might yeah. be a horse. He could have been a horse. Like, oh, that would have been horrible. I just love these. And again, this book is full of it. It These insights into these decisions we just assumed were natural. Yeah. And the quote on this topic that I love as well, it's actually from chapter five, but I wanted to bring it in here. Awada says, some say that the constraint is the mother of creativity. Love that. The oh, constraint yeah. is yeah. the mother of creativity. And to me, this is that context. It's 
oh yeah, we couldn't do it with the, the power that the SNES had. So, so we had to make Yoshi it? a dinosaur. Yeah. So make it work. And right, again, yeah. that is Nintendo every generation. Yeah. Nintendo, like you make the Switch so and you're like, true. the Switch has the power of the, the Xbox One. And like we're now at the, the next generation. But <laughs> they sit here and still make things that are amazing, though the constraints are there. And I, I just, I love that quote. I love that aspect so much because it's, it's true and it's the Nintendo way. And somehow they still go head to head with these big companies. They don't have the constraints they have. So chapter five, on to chapter five. This chapter is titled, The Games Iwata Strives to Make. So first off is a highlight from Nick. This is a quote that Nick had. It's about establishing a structural framework for play. As you experience more and more different things, the desire for novel forms of entertainment grows even stronger. If we tried to account for all of these wants and needs, a game console would never come together. For this very reason, we've created hardware that provides a structural framework for play so that different people can interpret the games in their own way and share their experiences with others. If the hardware has been engineered to have a robust framework, prompting a variety of gameplay, it greatly influences the potential for the system down the line. In that sense, I think that firmly establishing a promising foundation early on is among the most crucial aspects of designing a gaming platform. As I read this, I just was thinking that, man, they're, they're just so precise on thinking about things from the start. Yeah. Whereas it's not like, hey, let's build a system and let's uh, do this and do that. It's like, they they really think about like the core of how they want to do things at the front and then go f- go from there and innovate along the way and it's it, just it's it, nuts it ties back into the the more is the more is better like rejecting that philosophy yeah. because it's we provide a framework for fun yeah right yeah and it it actually shows that he talks about later Iwata was super stubborn about calling the Wii <laughs> controller yes. a remote oh i, I love that in this it's genius i have that in here i love that part and it's Absolutely love and it, it. this ties in perfectly because it wasn't it wasn't that they like were trying to come up with the next great thing of like for hardcore gamers in the wii is what they came up with the goal in mind was how do we get everyone and their families to play these games how do we get grandma and grandpa off the couch to enjoy games with their kids, it's not super demanding, it's not super competitive, it's a space where everyone feels free to play at their own capacity. And so that's, that was the goal behind the Wii. So it came to the decision of the controller, yeah. and he was like, well, it has, to be, it has to be this simple thing that would be sitting out on a coffee table, right? Well, what sits out on a coffee table? The remote always. So when it. you like yeah, when you it. phrase it that way, it's accessible to an older generation because they're like a controller, like A B X Y R L, like that means nothing to me. But when they see this basic, yeah. you know, the D pad, one button, maybe a little trigger on the back, it's so simple to approach. And so that was genius. I think that is one of the most simple but amazing ideas I think I've read in this book. Is just. That opened the door for my grandma to get off the couch and play Wii bowling. She's never played a game in her life, and mm-hmm. she was playing the Wii with us. And she's it was playing so Red, fun. Red Steel, like slash. Red fold. Steel. She's cutting guys in half. So I love this too because I played the Wii as a kid, and I called it the Wii Remote, and I didn't realize why I was calling it the Wii Remote. Like yeah. it's just something so passively, but it's something that very intentional. Like he was that's st- the word I'm thinking about. Stubborn about it. Like yeah. he was yeah. stubborn where he, it sounded like he had pushback and he's like, no, it is going to be called the remote. And today and the Wii is one of the most successful consoles ever. That's the DNA of Nintendo and this leadership is being very intentional about things like that. Yeah. No one's ever thinking about what we're naming controllers or, or consoles. Why change uh, it? Yeah. Right. Why change it? And there's a quote uh you know earlier from this section, but He's basically looking at the Wii in retrospect, and he's going, you know, when I look back at my career, I wouldn't change a thing about the Wii. Yeah. And like, of course, it's one of the greatest. It is one of the consoles. greatest, yeah. And it brings in grandmas, it brings in moms yeah. and dads, it brought in every generation, I think, at that time. And uh, why change it? So, yeah. Awada, visionary, he had these like small little things that we wouldn't think of, but they made a huge impact. So, next up is a quote talking about games and the power of they have as memories. And this is from Nick. Yeah, in my opinion, the strength of interactive entertainment epitomized by video games is that you look back 10 or 15 years after the fact and remember playing them. Granted, literature and movies can also leave a strong impression, but even when the memory is strong, you're often unable to so much as summarize the plot. 
However, because video games are interactive, allowing you to steer the action, they stimulate the brain in a peculiar and extremely powerful way. I mean, so how true. how true is this? It, in one of the weirdest ways I think about this, I literally think about Call of Duty maps or Mario 64, and I can walk as if I'm spectating <laughs> a, a yes. Counter-Strike. You're, yes. you're dead. You're, you're spectating. I can literally, in my mind, go around the map today yeah. and, like, it ingrains this experience in your mind that, like you'll never forget. It's yeah. it's truly something special. And not only that, not only like actually memorizing the framework of the game itself, I remember in detail the moments of my life when I was playing those games. Mm -hmm. Like I've attached, my brain has literally attached memories to video games I play. And I think like I will be an old man. And yeah. I, I, I imagine in my dreams, I imagine my grandson pulling out like an N64 and just getting this rush of memories of my friend and my neighbor, Tyler, growing up, like we'd print out cheat CC codes and we're like typing them in on Banjo-Kazooie. Yes. And, you know, oh. just all these silly things yeah. that you would do. I, I know exactly what we were doing. I remember the snacks we were eating. I remember that we were in my room and we were up super late. We weren't supposed to be awake. Yeah, I remember the music, it, just the whole experience. And so... I, I feel like every big game I've played that was memorable for me is also attached to a season of my life. Yeah. yeah. And oh. like games resonate again because it's putting you in their shoes, right? Yeah. He brings up movies and TV shows because you do get that perspective. But again, I'll always argue this. Games is a medium of art that allows you to see things from a different perspective. Nothing can do it better. Yeah, and you're not yeah. actually interacting with those. You're just passively consuming the other ones. And I think that's the, the, uh, the point to, you know, he says, they stimulate the brain in a peculiar and extremely powerful way. I think that's funny that, like... Did you just put that in? I did, yeah. <laughs> right, okay, sorry. This is sorry. a great section, but Nick put his... Nose face, ring on his... his face. Yeah, nose ring yeah on guys. His I'm face. into this. Dude, there's boogers on that thing, brother. Uh, <laughs> mini boogers. Look at that booger. Really I can't take you seriously Playing with it with your that. tongue. Just, uh, so, anyways, I, I love that. It's, it, it's so true, and uh, Nintendo... Again, Nintendo does that better than anyone else. Yeah, yeah. I think the takeaway from that, though, in the Wii Remote, all of this, is that they're thinking about these things. Like, that's what I took away from these sections, mm. was Nintendo's in their offices yes. thinking deeply about the way my experiences are going to be. And again, I love them more for it after yep. reading this book. Sure. Like, I have a higher appreciation uh, after reading Ask a Water. I'm more like willing a, to spend $80 maybe tomorrow. Maybe I, 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 might, I might buy Skyward Sword now. We'll yeah. see. <laughs> so the next quote this is a huge one we've we've teased it at the front this is about iwata's kind of thoughts on not changing nintendo's prices and ryan i want you to read this one okay oh it just makes my blood boil but it makes sense but it makes my blood boil yeah. but it's so stupid I, but I, I get what they're coming from but it's really stupid and i don't understand how they could come to that conclusion but i i understand let's hear it i'm not bitter after a piece of hardware is released, the price is gradually reduced for five years until demand has run its course. Mm -hmm. But since the demand cycle never fails, why bother reducing the price this way? My personal take on the situation is that if you lower the price over time, the manufacturer is conditioning the customer to wait for a better deal. Something I've always thought was a strange approach. Of course, this doesn't mean that I'm against lowering, pr lowering prices entirely, but I've always wanted to avoid a situation where the first people to step up and support us feel punished for paying top dollar. Grumbling, I guess this is the price I pay for being first in line. I want to hop in right there at the, on that quote, that ending quote. I guess this is the price I pay for being a first in line. That's what someone's grumbling who bought it on day one. Uh, Nintendo, if you're listening, I know you're not. <laughs> I've never felt that way. I bought things, <laughs> I bought things on day that one. so true. And when I see it go down in price... I'm not mad. I expect it. Yeah. I Every other it. game I've bought has gone down in price. But I do think it is an incentive for some people to wait. It, so yeah. hold on. He, and he, so there's a couple parts to this quote. I, res, I completely reject that last part where people, the logic is like, oh yeah, we're, we're going to honor our first adopters because they bought it on day one. Right. That's, that's BS. Yeah. To me, where I agree with it is that the video game industry is conditioning people yep. to wait. Yep. Nintendo does not do that. We know that. We know when I'm going to buy a Nintendo game. Well, I might as well buy it now because it's going to be $60 for right. the next four years. Even if I'm yeah. not going to play it yet. Their strategy works. They, yep. They're sticking to it. I understand that. The Switch is still $300. It's been $300 for the last four years. Good job. You did it. The last part, 
Don't lie to me about that. Yeah. That's, not, that's not real. It's such a bogus yeah. excuse. Yeah. Conditioning is, is true, though. I yeah. completely agree with that. Yeah, it's, it's not conscious, but it's a, it's a subconscious thing that's happening. Oh, my gosh, yeah. yeah. So I, I wait for all games. I wait for them to usually oh, yeah. go on sale. Ubisoft, dude, two months. Give it two months. Yeah, 30% <laughs> we, we, do that all, <laughs> we do that all the time. If it's a it's game so we're on the, on the fence about, eh, right. let's, let's revisit this. Yeah. So uh, the last quote of this chapter, Ryan, you highlighted this. And actually, I... I completely skipped this, and I think this is a, a, a big aspect that I, I don't know why it, it, I missed it. It might have been something else while reading. My reading comprehension is pretty low. So this yeah, is about did. Iwata's opinion about online gaming. This one actually resonated with me. Yeah. I, I had this experience as a young kid. I, I wouldn't, I'm a very competitive person, but it's hard. I have a low threshold where if I don't feel like I'm improving fast enough, I just give up, and okay. I just don't want to do it anymore. And in that in that since he, he's talking about online gaming, Iwata is mentioning that, in my view, the, only, the online games of the world are unfairly biased towards the strong. It takes bad luck of a hundred or a thousand players to make a single player happy. Of course, I don't mean to dim- dismiss these platforms wholesale, but as long as they retain this element, things will never expand beyond a certain level. As fun as it might look from the outside, most people will drag their heels at entrance. There has to be another way. I've spent so many years trying to figure out how to make these online games a place where parents can feel comfortable encouraging their kids to play and how to create a world where harassment is not an issue. So he kind of goes into a different idea towards the end of there. There's two things there. Yeah, but up front, I totally agree. Like online multiplayer is a extremely competitive space and people get super good. So if you're going to go into Call of Duty and you haven't played, you're just going to get crushed. And like that's yeah. just reality and you're going to have to play a lot. And so with like the time I have for video gaming, those aren't as big of a part of my life anymore yeah. because I'm just not as good at them. Yeah. Um, Halo is an exception. I am very good at Halo, so I will play the crap out of we'll Halo. See, we'll see when Infinite rolls around. I will destroy both of you. We these. still have anyway, a bet going on. But then he goes into also like the harassment. And so both of these are really shown in Nintendo's online. Yeah. They, they don't have this crazy competitive online space. Even their competitive games, I would argue, are pretty like cartoony and pretty nerfed. Like it's pretty easy to get a win on a lot of these games, right? Or there's no voice chat. And there's no voice chat. That's there's not this like interaction with strangers that you get at, with Call of Duty, right? Yeah. And so I think it is, I think they've accomplished that well. There's obviously it's intentional. And I agree with it. There needs to be like someone making games where you can play online without it crushing your spirit every time you turn on your console. The, the, the part of that quote that stood out to me the most is, it takes the bad luck of a hundred or a thousand players to make a single player happy. That's a battle royale. I literally, oh, yeah. I literally read that like two or three times. Because to me, I was just, I read that and I was like, wait, what did I just read? Yeah. And that, it's like a philosophical look into just a, a multiplayer game that, where you're playing with multiple that, people. And Nintendo Nick will re- never win Battle Royale because he crouches in the middle of a field <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thinking he's sneaking, but everyone can see him. It's a fort well, Ryan's inside. the guy that's like, let's freaking crash his car into a house. Well, it's like, hey, dude, people are watching it's us, really dude. It's really hard to shoot someone out of a car. That's all I'm saying. I, I love it. Anyways, that was, again, I, I'm shocked that I didn't highlight that because there's, there's multiple layers to that. I, I think it's... Again, we understand Nintendo so much better after reading this book. There's yeah. so much there. They're actual people. They're, they're people who yeah. are making conscious decisions and they're validated decisions. Iwata was data-based. Yeah. He, he wanted to see the data and he based his decisions off that data. Yeah. So that was the last quote from chapter five. We've got two chapters left. They're a little bit quicker chapters. The first of which, and this is where things start deviating from Iwata himself talking. This chapter is called, chapter six is called Remembering Iwata. And it's two parts. The first part is Shigeru Miyamoto remembering him, and then Shigesato Itoi, his, his two colleagues, his two friends, uh, remembering him. So the first of which is about, uh, and we can gloss over this quickly because we talked about it, Awada and Miyamoto having complementary skills, where Iwata was really good at kind of that coding aspect, and Miyamoto was kind of that creative side of things. So throughout their entire careers, they kind of like, again, it was like the the peanut butter and jelly of the world uh, right. of Nintendo making these amazing games together. Right. So the second quote that I want to bring up and, and Nick, I'm, I want to direct this at you. Okay. So Awada on dress code. Oh. And I'm going to read this quote and I want to ask you a question <clears throat> after. So this is coming from Miyamoto saying this, probably the one thing that we clearly disagreed on was our interpretation of the dress code. Iwata cared a great deal about this sort of thing. And even when there wasn't any rule in place, he came up with one and stuck to his own standards so that, 
so not as to offend anyone. In contrast, my personal opinion is that nobody really cares. Since Iwata was the highest ranking person at the company, I guess he sometimes had to take a stern approach, but his approach to laxness and strictness was unique. That's from Miyamoto. And like, you can see this, if you search a, a, an image of Miyamoto, <laughs> photos, Miyamoto. or Iwata, Iwata's in a suit with a tie, Miyamoto's wearing a t-shirt with a suit a jacket. A suit jacket, yeah, yeah like so a Pokemon still, t-shirt. Yeah, yeah, it's still not that. Like, he's still wearing a suit jacket. But Nick, I direct this at you because we talked about this. You're transitioning from a very corporate structure into a more relaxed structure. You work in HR. Where do you see dress code come into all of that? Yeah, I mean, I'm getting my getting my nose pierced, right? <laughs> That's, I mean, really, though, I bring it up. Yeah, I think it's I think it's just a cultural artifact, which you know, like a lot of a lot of cultural things are un- intangible, and uh, I think it here there was just something unique about his brain and the way it worked that he was saying like I have a standard and it's going to be here, but there's nothing in place. So like his his thoughts on this didn't conflict with the culture of Nintendo, but yeah. clearly that's not the culture of Nintendo. So I think it, it, it speaks to his uniqueness, but it, it's also just a general, you know, my thought on this is that, you know, the dress, dress code just doesn't matter. Yeah. It, it only matters as much as, as it matters, if that makes sense. You know, like it, coming it, from aviation, dress code mattered. Yeah. Uh, where I'm at now in, in, in fintech doesn't matter at all. Yeah. It has nothing to do with the people, their, their personalities, their ability to, to work hard, you know, like. People with tattoos aren't aren't just complete freaks. It's weird. I know a weird thing to think about. Nose but, rings, uh, though, yes. Yeah, nose rings, different story. Different story. <laughs> My boy Jack Dorsey. But yeah, I don't know. I, I thought that was really, really interesting. So It stood out to me, and I thought of you, because again, you work in HR, you work in kind of this corporate environment. Yeah. Uh, but it does resonate where it's like, Iwata's philosophy was not to force things on people. Yeah. And he wasn't forcing his dress code. Though he did dress. It was important to him. It was important to him. Yeah. But he didn't force it on anyone. I love that. Yeah. So Nick, the next thing is a quote from you that you highlighted. The kind of general topic is a good, man, a good name takes on a life of its own. Like that's the quote. A good name takes on a life of its own, even once the group or organization has dispersed. Yeah, the context, and correct me if I'm off on this, the context was about uh, he had named these groups called roundtables. And he did this very intentionally to invite other departments and people into these conversations so that multiple people could like look at the game development, pick it apart. And I think what he was saying here is that like uh, just another way where Iwata was really intentional about something, naming something, naming a group because yeah. he, he named it and then now it had a name and it had power yeah. and, it, and it had purpose. went on to be something else. Yeah. And so I thought that was really cool. Just back to this philosophical approach he had of, of naming things and on that topic he also emphasized facilitators in meetings yes, which that. i loved reading about that because i'm going to read this quote because there's there's a lot of importance i think from a, a corporate perspective but in his view of facility and this is uh miyamoto speaking again in his view a facilitator was a person who ensured that meetings were productive adding a touch of creativity where it was lacking or focusing the conversation when there was an ex- excess of creativity Effectively, it meant being the producer of a meeting. He made an effort to impress upon the company the importance in any kind of meeting of having a facilitator who was there to help the meeting show results. This sometimes meant tapping a specific person and saying, I need you, I need you to be the facilitator for this team. It's interesting how being called upon to service as a facilitator can expand your knowledge base. So I like that because it's also tapping someone and saying, hey, you, you're important. You need to do this for this meeting. And that brought kind of an empowerment aspect. And again, he was really good at empowering his employees. And I've been in so many meetings where if there's not a facilitator, if there's not someone driving it, it falls flat and I'm wasting my time. Yeah. And how many CEOs are just like, oh, I have an assistant for that. Or uh, where's Jerry at? Is he driving this meeting today? You know, it's like, no, he, I think the, some of the context right before that, he was saying that like, Iowata was a facilitator. And I thought that word facilitator was really interesting. And then he goes into that quote you just read. And yeah, just another man, just what a leader. Yeah. Uh, you know, he just was that middle person. He wasn't sitting at the top being being a jerk. Yeah. Last quote from Miyamoto. And this one is a sad one, but it, it's basically how I contextualize it. It's Miyamoto missing a friend. So the quote is, Iwata may have passed on, but the company is going strong. Thanks to all the ideas and systems that he left behind, our young hires have been able to thrive. What makes me sad is that if I have a crazy idea over the weekend, there isn't anybody I can tell about it on Monday morning. When I'm eating lunch, he isn't there to say, I think I figured out your problem, which leaves me feeling stuck sometimes. I really miss him. Mm. Dude. Wow. Yeah. Like, it's sad. That's super sad. Yeah. And that was, uh, I, I think, too. So, and the reason I, I'm adding context to these quotes 
I don't know how you felt. These were my two favorite chapters in the entire book. Chapter six. I feel like the, yeah, the last chapter where both Miyamoto and Itoya talk about him, I felt like that was like really illuminating. And he was saying like he was the kind of guy that would just like be listening to a conversation at lunch. And then a week later, be yes. like, hey, I think I solved your problem yeah. uh, that you were just talking about last week. Like I was listening to you. I didn't say anything, but like my brain was analyzing that that whole time. Yep. Yeah. Notice the, both the things that he misses are Iwato listening. Yeah. And it just goes to show you like a good listener is, is so effective with their relationships. Mm. And then also like the effectiveness of it too. Like when you do listen to someone, you can sit there and work on the actual problem, help them solve it. Like mm-hmm. Miyamoto's not just missing a friend, but someone that was kind of his other half of his brain yeah. where it's like, hey, I'm thinking through this and I can't finish it without him. Yeah. So that, that, there's tragedy in that. For clarification, Miyamoto, uh, super creative, right? We kind of talked about this. Oh my gosh. Creative right. director. Uh, where he was kind of like that right side of the brain, uh, and, left side of the brain. Yes. And then Miyamoto, uh, Iwata was the other side. Yeah. yeah. So it's, I, I love reading that. It's, it's again, super sad. Uh, the last kind of colleague friend is uh, Shigesato Itoi, worked with On Mother and Earthbound and some of these other projects. So Nick, I want to bring up something. And we, we talked about this at the beginning. We talked about Iwata's age. So Iwata came to being the president of HAL Laboratory in his early 30s. And then the president of Nintendo at age 42, like that is extremely young for both of those companies and their sizes. So again, I just wanted to make sure we brought up that statistic or those numbers. Nick, you had this one highlighted. Uh, This is a quote about, again, this is coming from Shigesato Atoy. Anything a computer does for you should be left to a computer. Nick, can you go into that one? Another thing that I remembered Iwata saying is anything a computer can do for you should be left to a computer. Maybe this is obvious to people who can leverage computers on a daily basis, but to me, it was a revelation. Iwata often said, people only want to do things only people can do. And I think that he was exactly right. This, the last sentence of this, the the first part made me think of like, when you you learn how to code and you learn how to program, and you actually learn that like a computer is just doing the inputs you put in there, but like way better. So like let a computer do math because... Why would you do math when a computer can do that? But people only want to do things only people can do. Yeah. And I think that was exactly right. And so when I I think about that, I was like, man, think about all the creative stuff Nintendo does. Those are things that not only can only people do that, but only kind of like the unicorns they have running those projects. You know, I look at Iwata and and, uh, Miyamoto and these guys as like unicorns. They're truly just visionary people. And they're leaning into their strengths and they're letting computers do the things that the computers can do. And I just found that, found that fascinating. So to wrap up Shigesato Atoy's kind of opinion of Iwata, I wanted to read one of like the final quotes from his section. So Iwata thoroughly enjoyed seeing people smile. This was behind his management philosophy for Nintendo. I think his life's work was to foster happiness. Dude, like completely. I, I, I love this because... It's a friend, it's a colleague, it's someone who's worked alongside him and saw his leadership, saw the results that he drove. It was always happiness. And it, I'm not trying to take jabs here, but I don't think that'll be said about Jim Ryan, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I just, yeah. there's other CEOs in this space that it's very clearly not about making people smile for them. And so I think that's what's unique about Nintendo is Everyone involved with the Nintendo believes in Nintendo, loves Nintendo, and would die with Nintendo. You know what I mean? Like they it's have the this beautiful, happy environment. And that's probably why they have so few, they keep it small so that they yeah. can like foster that environment yeah. rather than just like doing their blue ocean Being a kind of thing that they were talking about. They're com- going head to head with things. And yeah, fighting. and It's rare. It's, and it's rare to sit there and have someone who has his background. I think that's where his philosophy and his, his point of view came from of like, he coded, he yeah. was on the ground floor. He was in the weeds doing these things. And I can't say that for any of these other presidents mm-hmm. of these companies. Yeah. And I want to talk to their HR people because one of the number one restraints, it's probably the number one restraint for hiring is budget. And like Nintendo has zero budget issues yeah. at all. And so their decision to not staff up and get crazy and keep these values is very intentional. Yeah. Uh, and I can't imagine doing that. If I'm a company that's extremely profitable, my thought is like, how do we scale this up? How many people Dude. do we need for these spots, for these departments? And it's clear that they're not doing that. They're that, being very intentional. With, that's a great point. They have yeah. so much cash. When you look at their balance sheets at the end of the day, it's, you know, it's a public company. They have a ton of cash. Yeah. They could 
grow, but I think there's something to the simplicity we've talked about throughout Nintendo that that's the magic sometimes. Yeah. Mm. So I want to close. Chapter seven is pretty short. It, it's called Iwata the Person. The last quote that I want to close out this entire kind of discussion with is the closing quote of the book. And it's, no part of my experience has turned out to be a waste of time. And that was directly from him. Mm. And again, like, it's so consistent with everything we've talked about during the course of this episode. Yeah, I think it's, uh, in essence, it's just all about, like, loving your life, you know? Iwata didn't, like, love his day-to-day tasks. He didn't love, you know, when nintendo made a bad decision he didn't love like all of the negative parts of your job you don't have to but he loved his life and he loved making people smile and that's all he knew so he was going to do everything in his power to make the people around him happier and ultimately that led to the company he worked for making millions of people happier yeah right yep it started with just loving the people that were in his proximity and it ended up resulting in tons of people being happier that's it, ripple. it reminds me of a Oh, here we get sentimental. It reminds me of a Mother Teresa quote. It was like, if you want to change the world, go home and love your family. Yeah. It's like, he lived that. Yeah. He, he just loved his Nintendo family and it changed the world. On that topic too, they talk about his son with him and they used to go and walk. They yeah. used to walk together and just think. And they were, you know, there's something to someone who was also a good businessman, but a good father. And that resonated so much. So guys, ask Awada. Final thoughts. Mm. I would just say you should read it. Yeah, yeah, if you like Nintendo, if you like business, if you like uh, just reading about any of that stuff, it's it's a great book. And for gamers, I think it'll give you a little bit more insight in, into Nintendo, which yeah. we, we've always been wanting that because Nintendo can come across as this mysterious unicorn sometimes, at least to me. So no, I completely it's, it's agree. Nice. There was no wasted time in this book, I felt like. Yes, Very yeah. much valued our time because it was just these short little, almost like proverbs, you yeah. know, these short little stints where he just provided wisdom and that's it. We didn't need anything else. And so it's short, beautiful read, uh, tons of wisdom there. It's you know? super lean. Yeah, it's like about 150 pages. And again, like it's, there's aspects here that I just am a little bit more empathetic when it comes to yeah. Nintendo's business strategies. I, I, because of this book, I love Nintendo more. And man, yeah, Iwata was an amazing person. And personally, I hope to be a leader like him someday. Iwata, yeah. if you're listening in the afterlife, <laughs> send a message. F0X, bring it back. <laughs> or mother, even mother. Or mother. mother. Yeah. Guys, on that note, let's wrap this up. So some housekeeping. Housekeeping. Upcoming reviews. Nick is currently reviewing Biomutant. Mm. Ryan and I are reviewing Horizon Zero Dawn. We're going back to that because, hey, we've got Horizon Forbidden West coming up. We've got to catch up. We've got a review coming out for that. Sony Ponies now. Loving it so far. Uh, On the topic of Nintendo, Ryan and I are going to review Pokemon Snap. Yeah, we are. And it's great. Spoiler alert. You liking it so far? Yeah. Okay. I haven't started. I'm still playing Horizon. Uh, after that, Nick and I have talked about doing some Miles Morales. Yeah. I, I, we have to do Miles Morales. We played Spider-Man. Obviously, we had some weird Spider-Man fatigue after where we couldn't hop right, right into Miles Morales. We were Spider-Man limp is what I would describe it as. You did describe it on that episode. Nick, I'm curious. I'm still going to put this in this episode. Disco Elysium. Ooh. Are you still going to fully review this bad boy? Yeah, I think so. It's, it's really tough. I was discouraged because there's a couple reviews out there of the PC version, and they're incredible reviews yeah like i mean just super incredible reviews and it's kind of like man i don't know if i should just review that but yeah i'm i'm halfway through it and it's just such a unique experience it's I want, definitely not for everyone i want to hear your thoughts so yeah i do i have been I, talking about this game for a long time i hope so, you can yeah. finish it nick this i think you're on your own on this one I you gotta finish in. nick well i'm just telling you man last night i was in the bath playing bio mutant finishing on an ipad yeah. On PS Share, and it was nice. Nice. Just, just uh, I like that lifestyle. So, yeah, Bio Mutant and. Uh, we'll get Bio Mutant first, disco. maybe Disco after. Yeah. Uh, if there's anything out there, listener, viewer, if you want us to review anything, please let us know. You can contact us on Twitter at Bush League GMNG for me, at Bush League Ryan for Ryan, at Nick A Beard for Nick. Email us, Bush League Games at gmail.com. We love getting emails. We don't we get, get any. tons of them. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I thought we were both going to go with that. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, we get so many. Uh, yeah, we don't get any. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Don't email us. <laughs> um, you can support us. Support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Bush League Gaming, where you can buy some merch. Bush League Gaming.com slash store. I'm wearing some Bush League Gaming shirt right now. This is part of the it's new fly. summer line. It feels great. It's very soft. Uh, it's only XL right now for some reason. <laughs> um, the other thing you can do to support us, this is huge right now. With a drive towards video, 
The first week of July is going to be our first full video podcast. That's going to be our one-year anniversary. We need your help. If you've been a listener for a long time, please go to YouTube, take your Gmail account, take your YouTube account, subscribe to Bushley Gaming. There's a link. There's going to be a link in this description. We need your subs to get that custom URL. We're trying to get to 100, so we'd appreciate your support. Mm. And uh, guys, I appreciate you being here today. This was one of my favorite discussions we've ever had. I yep. love, I love Nintendo. I love Iwata. I think these are amazing things. I do. Yeah. I, I feel like I wouldn't have said that like a few months ago. Even yeah. though I do love Nintendo, I wouldn't have just said that. But here I am saying I, I just have a deep appreciation for what they're doing there. Yeah. I love Yoshi so much more. <laughs> Guys, we'll see you next week. I love you. Bye. Bye. There's boogers on that thing, brother. <laughs>